Hello, good friends. I've said several times that I consider myself the most privileged of men. And one of the reasons for that is the number of places that I've been privileged to travel and to see how beautiful they are. This was brought to my mind because our oldest son, Christopher, and his family recently took a dream vacation. Or maybe some people might see it as a nightmare vacation, but it was pretty neat. <laughs> Their second son, Tobijah, is in fourth grade this year. And the government of the United States has made it so that any family that's traveling with a fourth grader this year can enter all the national parks and monuments for free and a whole lot of national parks and monuments uh, that the kids and my daughter-in-law had not yet seen are in the western part of the country. So they decided to go toward them. There they go. <laughs> in two very long days they made it as far as the Carlsbad Caverns and then after touring that magnificent place, they went to the White Sands of New Mexico, and from the White Sands they went to the Petrified Forest and the Painted Desert and the Grand Canyon and various parks in Utah, the Monument Valley, the Natural Bridge, the Arches National Monument, Capitol Reef, Bryce Canyon, and Zion Canyon. They played in the water and saw the wildlife. All of this was in the first week. In the second week, they went to California, started off in Death Valley, and they happened to hit it on one of the hottest days in years. It made it practically to 126 degrees, which is brutally hot. Just a couple of days later, the temperature broke the record of many years, since the 1930s, I guess, and made it to 128 degrees. So, you can tell it was hot the day they were there. And of course, when it got hot like that, there's the danger of the motor overheating. And as a result, you have to turn off the air conditioner. So it got really hot for them. In fact, a couple of them were losing everything that was in their stomachs before they got out to where they could turn the air conditioner back on. As we often say in our family, that was one of those days that you get a story to tell to your grandchildren. <laughs> Death Valley, by the way, is the lowest point in North America. It's 282 feet below sea level. On the other hand, it's only 80 miles from Mount Whitney. And Mount Whitney is the highest point between basically Alaska and the mountains of Mexico. So here's a peak that dominates all of the 48 contiguous states and most of Canada as well and it's only 80 miles from the lowest place. The lowest place and the highest place then are really close together, which is a, a fascinating thing to me. So they escaped from the hand, or maybe we should say from the breath of death, and made their way around the bottom of the Sierra Nevada, past the Joshua Tree Monument, all the way to the Pacific Coast. And they had a good time there with some friends from long ago, and then came back inland to go up to Sequoia National Park. Sequoia National Park is, of course, where the sequoia trees are, the biggest of them all being General Sherman. You can get a feel for the size of the General Sherman by looking at the little people at the very bottom of the picture. The tree is 272 feet high, almost as high as Death Valley is below sea level. If it were growing down at Badwater Basin in Death Valley, the top of it would only be 10 feet below sea level. The tree is also over 36 feet in diameter. It's a little hard to measure the diameters of trees, partly because they aren't circles. <laughs> what part of it are you going to measure? But it's generally accepted that the Tule tree near Oaxaca City in Mexico is a little bit bigger and is probably the biggest tree in the world as far as diameter. The Tule tree, however, is only 115 feet high, not half as high as General Sherman, and its trunk doesn't go up nearly as far before it splits into branches. General Sherman may be the biggest tree in the world, but it's not the tallest. The tallest ones are actually quite close by. Those are the coastal redwoods, which are actually another species of sequoias, but not the giant sequoias that are General Sherman and the others of its kind. Those are nearby, near the coast of California, but Chris and his family didn't get to see them. 
They also didn't get over to the White Mountains on the other side of the Sierra Nevada, which is where the oldest trees in the world are, bristlecone pines, and some of them are 4,700 years old. Instead of heading off to see those marvels, they went up to the divide between Sequoia National Park and Kings Canyon. And on the way back down, they went over a road that's very difficult. It's very, very steep with lots of switchbacks and huge drops off the side. It would be a difficult road for any vehicle, but they were in their beloved Harvey the RV. So it's pretty unwieldy and it was quite a process to get downhill. By putting the car in first gear and inching their way down, using the brakes a whole lot, which you don't like to do in that kind of situation, they made it down. The next day they went over to Yosemite National Park, which is pretty much universally recognized as one of the most beautiful places in the world, and enjoyed seeing the marvels there. And then they headed back into the central part of California again and headed north. They went by Lake Tahoe and went up into Idaho. While they were in Idaho, they blew a tire out, and as Chris said, well, thank the Lord that it wasn't on that road and in Sequoia in Kings Canyon, and it wasn't the front tire, it was one of the back ones. But anyhow, they got that changed. Then they went by Craters of the Moon, which is one of the weirdest places I know. Lots of lava formations. They went on then to Grand Teton National Park, which is, for my taste, probably the most beautiful of all the parks. And the day after that, they went up to Yellowstone, which encompasses in one space more geological and biological and other kinds of spectacular marvels of any place that I know. From there, they went past the Devil's Tower, which is an amazing geological formation. It's a wonder to me that it's not more famous. And then from there to the Badlands of South Dakota, that day they saw the Mount Rushmore Memorial also. And finally, after that, they were ready to start heading home for real. In a long day's drive, they made it to St. Louis, where they saw the Gateway Arch, and then from St. Louis, they made it home in one more day. 21 national parks and monuments in three weeks. It's quite a feat to do that. <laughs> and they've earned themselves memories that are going to last for a lifetime. This will change their lives. My grandchildren and my son and his wife, too. They have left lots and lots of memories and a bunch of mementos and they gave their kids cameras and so among them all they had 8,000 pictures. Just about the same time our son in Thailand went with his family to take a vacation at an island that's on a bay there and they had a great time enjoying the water, the ocean, the cliffs on the island that you can jump off of. scuba diving and snorkeling. It was a wonderful time for them. And our daughter and her family who live in Pennsylvania went to Lake Michigan, quite a long trip, but they get together with cousins every year and enjoy the beach. They also enjoy the many beautiful places near their home in Pennsylvania. And our daughter and her family that live up in Seattle, well, they're surrounded with natural beauty too and they go visit those places and enjoy them. Holly and Ben also take advantage of the natural beauty of places that they visit. All of this delights me for a number of reasons. Of course, it's just a wonderful thing that my kids and grandkids are able to enjoy such beautiful places. It's a tradition in our family from many, many generations. My ancestors, great-great-great-grandparents, came over from Europe mostly England and France, to the New World in sailing ships or else in steamships when there were such. <laughs> Once in the New World they crossed the continent by covered wagons or once the tracks were there, steam trains. My grandparents and my parents traveled a whole lot. In fact, my first memory is of something that happened on a trip. We were going from Venezuela to the United States on a tanker this was in the summer of 1951, so I was a year and a half old. And mom and dad were standing near the bridge of the tanker, and a big wave hit the side of the ship and sent spray up high enough that it got them all wet. The memory that I have is of them cleaning their glasses, and I was thinking to myself, I wish I had glasses that I could clean. 
Well, it's one of those prayers that God answered for me very positively. I've had plenty of classes. On that trip, while we were in the States, Dad got a 1937 Buick. And uh, he used it to pull a teardrop trailer. And we went to lots and lots of places. I remember particularly a picture, though I can't find it right now, of the Buick and the teardrop trailer at Yosemite coming through the Wawona tree, which was a sequoia that had a hollow place, almost a tunnel in the middle, and cars could drive through it. Unfortunately, it fell over in 1969, so it's no longer there. Mom and Dad had four kids at that time. In 1958, we were back in the States. By then, we were seven kids, and Mama was expecting the eighth. Dad got a school bus, and we used that as a motorhome. This was long before the days of most people's motorhomes, but uh, we drove around the country in this school bus and raised a tent on the top, as you can see. And then we took it down with us to Venezuela, and it served as transportation for the Bible Institute, where my parents taught replacing a couple of trucks that uh, we had previously used to carry people around. In 1963, my parents were on furlough again, and the trip that year was epic. We started off driving clear across Venezuela, and then we took a combination of uh, DC-3s, the old World War II airplane, <laughs> and buses uh, to go from the Venezuelan border across Colombia. Unfortunately, we weren't able to stay there long. But then we went to Tulcan on the Ecuador border and made it down to Quito. My grandparents, uh, Mama's parents, lived in Quito at that time. From Quito, we eventually got down to the jungle area where my Uncle Glenn and his family lived. I fell in love with Ecuador and its mountains on that trip. As you come down from Tulcan, one of the mountains you see is Cayambe, which is the only place on Earth where the equator has permanent ice and snowfalls. It's also the place on Earth furthest from the Earth's axis, so as the Earth spins, the peak of Cayambe is the point that moves the fastest, and therefore things on top of it weigh the least. And it's a beautiful mountain. Quito is just a few miles further south. And from Quito on south, there's just a whole avenue of incredible volcanic peaks. Cotopaxi is probably the most famous. It's a beautiful cone. Right there by Quito is Pichincha. We went up, actually, to one of the Pichinchas. I don't remember if it was Ruku Pichincha or Wawa Pichincha. Ruku is the old man and Wawa is the baby, but they're both pretty high peaks. What we didn't see was Chimborazo. Chimborazo is the point on Earth's surface that's furthest from the center of the Earth. So in some sense, Chimborazo is the highest mountain on Earth. Higher than Mount Everest by quite a bit by that measure. Uh, just an anecdote. Three of Uncle Glenn's kids, my cousins Beatrice and Esther and David, with some companions climbed Chimborazo back when they were teenagers. They arranged things so that Beatrice would be the first woman to climb Chimborazo, and Esther would be the youngest woman to have climbed it, and David was the youngest person to climb it at that point. And while they were up there, they made a human pyramid three levels high. David was on the top, so I think he needs to be in the Guinness Book of World Records as the person who had been furthest away from the center of the earth while still supported directly from the ground. Anyway, Chimborazo is the mountain we didn't see, but we did see Antisana and the Ilinisa peaks. We eventually made it down to the jungle and were flown out in a little plane to Chinimbi where Uncle Glenn and his family lived. There's a great big geological fault that runs across the jungle there for miles and the eastern side of that fault is about 90 feet higher than the western side. So there's a 90 foot cliff and they built the airstrip right at the edge of that cliff. The pilot said it was like coming in to land on an aircraft carrier. But the neat thing was that you could sit there and look out over the tops of these enormous jungle trees for miles and miles, and there on the horizon was the peak of Sangai, which is a beautiful volcanic cone. And Sangai was in eruption at that time, so at night you could see lava flowing down the slopes of the mountain. 
I've only once been able to go back to Ecuador, but I, it's there forever in my heart. I remember it as one of the most beautiful places on earth. We went back to Quito and then flew to the States, again in these DC-3s, they go a lot slower than the jets nowadays. And we stopped off in Panama, so we got to see the Panama Canal from the air and at least be in that country. And then we had a wonderful adventures driving around the States again. I won't go into them, but it was an epic, epic trip. Several years later, in 1969, so I was 19, Joy and I were already engaged, and we spent the summer in Mexico. I was in the town of Ixmiquilpan, Hidalgo, where there was a linguistics workshop going on, and Joy was in Mexico City with her family. At the end of that summer, we drove up from Mexico all the way to North Carolina in a 1936 Chevy that's fondly known by the name of Don Lazaro. It's in a museum now in Waxhaw, North Carolina, by the way. And let me tell you, I have a raft of stories I could tell you about that trip. <laughs> we got married in 1970 and spent our honeymoon driving up to Grand Forks, North Dakota to attend the Summer Institute of Linguistics there. And on the way broke in our very first house, which you can see there in the picture. That fall, we drove down to Mexico to begin studying Nahuatl. At the end of that year, we also went to the state of Chiapas to the jungle training camp that the Summer Institute of Linguistics ran down there. We spent almost five months in the Selva Lacandona, that is the Lacandon jungle. Some of it at a place called Yashoquintela on the Hatate River, and then a time by a lake called Ocotal Chico. You can see from the picture here that we built a balsa raft and put a sail on it so we could tool around on the lake. Lots and lots of trips and lots of memories and lots of places known. And that was just in the first 20 years of my life. As soon as the kids started coming along, we took them along, of course. Christopher was our first child. You can see in the picture here that his mother's holding him in Grand Teton National Park, the same place that he took his kids to a few weeks ago looking across the lake at those marvelous mountains. We also took him up on Popocatepet in central Mexico and up into the Oaxaca mountains and we took him to the beach and we did all kinds of trips in that first year of his life. And as the other kids came along, we took them along too, of course. I'll just show two pictures. One of them shows all five kids in front of the Dodge van that carried us around from one place to another for many years. And the second one shows the five of them at the beach at San Carlos in the state of Sonora. Those of you that are followers of Super Holly probably know that she's the youngest of the family, so you can identify her in the pictures. I hope you can see a bit of why we consider ourselves so privileged. To be able to go to so many exotic places and enjoy the beauty of them, it's just amazing. The best word I can think of to describe the emotion that wakes in me is just gratitude. I feel so thankful. I feel thankful to the people that invented the machines that we use to get to these places. When my grandparents were born, hardly anybody had ever seen an automobile, and nobody had seen an airplane that worked. But we've gotten so used to them, we tend to forget how wonderful they are. How it is that we can decide we want to go to some place, we can go down to the airport, hop on a plane, and in just a few hours we're hundreds and thousands of miles away from where we started. If I want to go see my brother who lives 50, 60 miles away, I hop in the car and within about an hour I'm there. What a miracle that is! Think of how many generations of humans on this earth could never do that, and how amazed they would be if they could see how we do it. I have half a dozen times gotten on an airplane and before a whole day was out I was on the other side of the world. I've flown for instance from Chicago to Beijing, right across almost at the North Pole. Can you imagine that happening? I've seen the polar ice from 35 or 40,000 feet altitude. It's just a wonder that this could happen. It's a miracle. And we owe it to lots and lots of people that contributed to the amazing vehicles that we're able to use to get to these places, and those that developed the roads, and I'm grateful to them. Being able to get to these places is wonderful. What about how beautiful they are when we get there? I can assure you, any place you go in the world, there is beauty to be seen. Sometimes there's ugliness too, but there is beauty. Someone once said that the hardest moment for an atheist is when he sees a spectacular sunset and there's nobody to thank. 
Something inside of me really jives with that statement. I believe I really would have a hard time if I had that sort of philosophy. But I don't. My understanding and my conviction are that God created these things, and they're good gifts from Him, and I'm grateful for them. I think it's C.S. Lewis that says somewhere that if you only look at nature, you might well come to doubt whether God is a kind or a good God, but you'd have a lot harder time concluding that he's not an artist. And I see artistry so strongly in what God has made. Now, of course, a lot of people say, well, it all just came about naturally. It just uh, arose from the ingredients that were out there, the uh, building blocks of nature, and it's all just an automatic process unfolding. And okay, you can think that. You can also think that a bowl of pozole that I might get from Polinazzi and Tetelcingo, or some wasontles and especia de jitomate like Elodia used to make for us, that these just arose naturally from the ingredients. After all, they're all natural ingredients. Yeah, but I still know somebody chose the ingredients and mixed them together in just the right way. Somebody put their hand in there and stirred things and made it come out just right for our taste and for our benefit. For this picture that you can see here at my right hand, I'm indebted to my mother. She's the one that painted it. But I also feel a debt of gratitude to God for inventing that view, that Caripe Valley that turns out looking so beautiful. And the plants that are on the mountains and that give the scene its particular character. God made them. He made my mama too, with the result that she was able to make that painting. All of the scenes, all of the landscapes, all of the beautiful places that we were looking at in this whole video come from his hand, and I'm grateful for them. I've been one of the most privileged people in the world to go to so many places and to see such incredible beauty in them.